Hi everyone, this is Jan Kabili. I'm here with some of my friends, my very good friend Ron Clifford, my co-host here on the Photoshop Show. Hi Ron. Hello, how are you doing? I'm pretty good tonight, how are you? I'm doing great, I had a, a wonderful day. I had a weekend of rest which was really rare, I just decided to put the brakes on. Sometimes you got to do that in my life. I just came to Sunday and I said that's it, putting the brakes on, kicked up my feet. I even had a Sunday afternoon nap which I haven't enjoyed in a very long time. And uh, yeah, it just really rejuvenated me. So, doing great. You know, I could tell you really look great. You look like you know, the Ron of old, at least twenty <laughs> years younger than you are. <laughs> oh, thank From you. From days of not, yore. Not bad for eighty-six, I'll tell you. <laughs> and then I'm so happy to see my friends Dave Bell and Erica Thornis. Hi, you guys. Doing great. Hey. Great to be here again. It's so fun to be able to come back every couple of weeks and see people in person. It's almost like going out and, you know, going to a bar together or something. Isn't it? <laughs> Except we can actually hear each other. <laughs> Good point. Anything new with you guys? Not really. I haven't had much chance to get out the last couple of weeks to shoot. So just uh, working on things here at home. For me, I've been doing event um, event shooting, which I love, and I got to tour a beautiful home today that I'm going to be doing an event this summer at. So um, my life is good and busy, and I'm doing what I love, so I'm happy. Aren't you lucky? That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And I saw your great pictures from Easter. Was it Easter Sunday with your children and your um, and their cousins right next door? And they just they're all so beautiful. Oh my God. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. It's nice living here in warm, sunny San Diego. <laughs> Makes it easier to take photos. Well, the other thing I love, Erica, is that you show people that they can take family photos and still make art of them and make them wonderful photographs. Um, and that, I think, is really important. You know, that um, I don't think you have to separate your life into, I'm going to take pictures of people that I love because I want to have their memory, and I'm going to take fancy schmancy, you know, photographs that everybody speaks about, right? It's fun. It's just, it, yeah. It's fun to find interesting backdrops, and it's fun just to let my kids be my kids and have their personalities come through. So that's fun. You do it very well. Thank you. <laughs> and we have someone tonight that I am so, um, I don't know, grateful to, I guess is one word, and I like so much, and that is Mr. Sean Duggan. Hi, Sean. Hey, Jan. Hey, everybody. And I was so happy to have had all these opportunities to work with you lately um, in here on the Photoshop show, and you've also been helping me to write a book, haven't you? Indeed, indeed. I stepped in and uh, was able to work on one chapter of uh, your latest book project. Which is? Which is? Well, you, you, you better t say what the official title is. I might get it wrong. Okay. It's called The uh, Lightroom and Photoshop for Photographers, Classroom in a Book. It's the official classroom in a book for using these two programs together, which is, I think, really, really, really important. Don't you? Oh, yeah, totally. And, and I think that a lot of people who are coming to Lightroom may not necessarily have a lot of Photoshop experience, um, especially if they're just getting into digital photography, uh, or if they've been using another program like Photoshop Elements. Uh, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good title. I've been pretty impressed with your... Uh, your chapter list and all of the topics you've been covering. So I um, was uh, happy and honored to be able to contribute uh, a little bit to that. Well, I really appreciate it. And one of the great things about doing this show is being able to get, um, you know, kind of more, I don't know, conversant with people that I kind of used to know sort of, kind of, and saw once a year. And now you get to see them all the time. And so that leads to collaboration on projects, which is so great and I think always enhances a project to have people who are like-minded working on it. Isn't it neat? Yeah. Oh, excellent. Yeah, yeah. De definitely adds a lot to it as well. Yeah. So thank you for doing that. I appreciate oh, you're it. welcome. You're welcome. I was happy to be able to help out and, uh, uh, as I said, honored that you that you asked me. Well, I um, also am honored to have you on the program tonight because I know that you have worked out some terrific techniques, really unique techniques for working with video and still images together. And I hope you're going to show us those tonight. That's the plan. I've got a, I've got a few things uh, lined up here to show, and uh, I look forward to sharing it with uh, everybody here and everybody out there in, in Weblandia. <laughs> All right, so tell us. Give us a little preview of what's coming. So um, what a lot of people don't realize is that you can 
edit video in Photoshop. And um, it kind of flies under the radar a little bit. And um, you've been able to work with video clips for a while in Photoshop, but it really kind of took a step forward in Photoshop CS6. Uh, that's where Photoshop got a regular timeline uh, interface for working with video, which is, you know, uh, the same sort of interface that other, you know, full-featured video programs used, like Premiere and After Effects, things like that. And so uh, once I discovered that, that you could really do, you know, basic stuff in video, I started to ask myself, well, what else could I do? So I just started kind of pushing the envelope trying to figure out h how far I could go with this. And a lot of my interest uh, around it stemmed from uh, wanting to do, um, I guess for want of a better word, special effects type motion graphic shots, as well as add video and motion to some of my still composites. So I really like the idea of taking an interesting composite that I constructed and then, you know, bringing in video and sort of turning it into something that could be used either just as a standalone kind of a motion composite is what I call them, or uh, even just sort of a, almost like a special effects type shot in a, you know, a small film project. So, um, really cool. I mean, I saw this stuff just by chance, I think, in when you were trying to get people to come to a workshop you were doing, and you had made kind of a little intro video to your workshop, and I was like, what is that? That has moving parts, and it has still parts, and I found it really intriguing and really unusual, and so I'm looking forward to you showing us that, as well as giving us an introduction to using video in Photoshop. Will you? Yeah, definitely. Okay, So, cool. should, we, should we get right to it? Let's go. Okay, all right, all right. So let me, uh, uh, actually, before before I share my screen, let me just sort of uh, get a couple of uh, uh, caveats out of the way. Um, for those people who already are familiar with uh, full-featured video editing programs like Adobe Premiere or uh, motion graphics programs like After Effects, um, it's important to realize that Photoshop is not at all a replacement for those. It doesn't come close to what their level of functionality is. And if you're already uh, hip and conversant with, you know, doing video work in those programs, uh, then that's, you know, where you're going to want to stay because, you know, once you know what those programs are capable of, you'll kind of run up against the limitations of what Photoshop is capable of. Uh, but what Photoshop is good for is for people who aren't familiar with, um, Premiere or After Effects or programs like that, but who want to be able to do some basic video editing, or for people who uh, want to just sort of play around with uh, motion graphics effects or special effects type shots, such as I've been doing. Um, and, and what's good about it is that if you have some basic Photoshop knowledge, such as layers, layer masks, blending modes, things like that, it's actually pretty easy to pick up the video editing uh, interface in Photoshop because pretty much everything you already know about Photoshop can be um, applied to working with video. So that's what's great. You can leverage what you already know about Photoshop and apply it to your video project. So that's really uh, kind of what you should keep in mind when you go into working with video in Photoshop. It's not a full featured program for video, but I was actually, in my kind of experiments, once I, you know, got this bee in my bonnet, like, hmm, how much can I do with this? I was actually pretty surprised at some of the things I was able to achieve. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is, and this time I will share my screen. Uh... Well, while you're doing that, I'll say that I totally agree with you. I keep thinking, Jan, you need to really start spending more time processing video. And I never have time to deal with a whole other program. When I found out you could do it in Photoshop, I just took a look and I'm like, oh, I already know how to do this. When I did when I, um, I had hummingbirds outside last spring, and so I used that. I did a lot of still shots, but then when you're watching them feed, I would do little video clips. And so it was super easy to learn how to just process those, and so we could make short little videos, and it was great, and the kids loved it, and I felt that my knowledge of Photoshop just instantly carried over, and I didn't wasn't learning a whole new program. So I think it's wonderful. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. That's that's the whole point, is that you can take what you know about Photoshop. So is my screen share coming through? Yep. Okay. So what I'm showing here is just uh, my page at Vimeo, and the reason I'm doing that is that uh, the demos that I'm going to be showing tonight, uh, the finished versions of those videos are all up here on Vimeo. So we're not really able to actually play 
video smoothly in a hangout like this. It gets kind of choppy and, and funky. Um, so uh, for those of you watching who want to see the finished versions of what I'm going to be showing you, they're all up here. And I'm going to be concentrating primarily on showing um, clips from my Creative Discoveries in Iceland video, which is a, a video about a workshop I'm teaching in Iceland uh, in the fall of this year. And I'm also going to be showing uh, some stuff from the Bear River title sequence, which is a um, title sequence for a fake TV mystery show. Um, and I'm also going to be showing, if I have time, a little bit of the time clock or the time spy um, clip here, which is basically a composite where I created this giant clock with a waterfall flowing out through it. So that's where you can go, and I believe that uh, we have a link up to those in the uh, the chat room. Um, yeah, just put that up there, the two, the Bear River and the Time Spy links are in there now. Okay, and you can go, um, so, so those are the YouTube links, right, Ron? Those are the links you provided, so is that, um, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, or, or if just, you just go to uh, yeah, Vimeo.com. Repeat that, Sean. What? Just go to vimeo.com slash Sean Duggan and you'll find my stuff. Because the Iceland one is not up on YouTube currently. So why do you put your stuff on Vimeo instead of, Ice, uh, instead of YouTube? Curious. You know, the quality is a lot better, basically. Huh. I, I just like the, 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 the playback of the quality, you know. And, and for, for some of these, I'm not necessarily uh, putting them up seeking a lot of um, uh, exposure to them. They're just sort of up there as, as a place where I can have them and, and, you know, embed them and stuff like that. But generally, I like the visual quality better than what I get on YouTube. All right, so let me come over here and go over to my desktop here. And I'm going to open up a, a video file into Photoshop and we'll just get started. So I'm just going to take this shot of the, the waterfall here. And I'm just going to drag it down onto the Photoshop icon in the dock to open it up into Photoshop. So what we have here is the uh, motion workspace in Photoshop. And that is uh, something that you can access by going to the window menu in Photoshop and just choosing workspace and you'll see that there is a motion workspace. Uh, the main addition to the work, workspace that makes it the motion workspace is the timeline panel, which is down here at the bottom. And so the timeline panel is essentially very similar to the layers panel, except it controls the duration of a layer, how long that layer is visible over time. So right now, this is a video clip. Let me just mute, make sure the sound is muted. I don't know how well this will play in Photoshop. Is it looking kind of choppy? No, it's good. Oh, okay. Good. All right. So just a video of the waterfall there. And what I'm going to do first is I'm going to add a couple of other clips and we'll talk about just sort of basic video editing techniques in Photoshop, how to trim clips to a certain time, how to fade from one clip to another. And then we'll start talking about doing things that you might do to your still photographs in Photoshop, like adding adjustment layers, uh, things like that for a little bit more customization. Uh, and then I'll move into some of the, the more special effects. So, I, Can I ask you something first? I'm assuming you took this with a DSLR, is that correct? Yes, this was taken with a uh, Canon 5D Mark III. And, this and the is hallmark of that is that you get that shallow depth of field I could see in the front. Right, and that, that's the beauty of shooting video with a digital SLR is that you're able to, to get that, you know, kind of shallow depth of field that you're used to with still photography um, and, and it really is not a quality that's associated with actual video cameras. Um, so, and, and you know, the, the, the reason that I think it's important to know that you can edit video in Photoshop is that, you know, pretty much every camera you buy these days can shoot video, even if it's just a small camera or your phone. So uh, everybody is probably generating lots of video. Once you know that you can work with it in Photoshop, you can you know get a lot done with it and have some fun. So I'm going to bring in uh, another video clip. And on the layer here in the timeline, there's a little you know film strip icon. And I can just click that and choose to add media. And I can come out here to my 
folder where I got that from, and I can choose uh, another clip. And I think what I'll do is I'll grab this clip and maybe this clip and this clip and this clip for now. And we'll bring those in. And then over in the Layers panel on the right side of my screen, you'll see that it's added all of these into a video group. And if I scroll through the timeline at the bottom here, you can see that what it's done, it, it has sequentially arranged the layers one right after the other. So if I were to play this, it would play each clip until it's done and then jump to the next clip, etc., etc. So that's what a video group is, is this arrangement of these video clips in here. And we're going to do some editing to this to, to change these around. The first thing I want to do is I want to change the order because I really would like the flowers to be after the waterfall. So I'm just going to take this in the main layers panel and just drag it and reposition it like it would any other layer. And you can see that it has reflected that change here in the timeline panel down below. It is after the waterfall. So that looks pretty good. And then I'm going to rearrange this. I'm going to put this sort of more colorful picture of the ice right after the flowers. And then finally, I want to have the photographer shooting the ice right after that. And then I've got the last clip. So now these are arranged in the order that I want them. And now I want to talk a little bit about just how you can change the duration. So right now I have this time counter up here which tells me how many seconds each clip is. So the first clip of the waterfall is about 15 seconds, which is really too long. So I'm going to adjust that. I'm going to place my cursor along the sort of the seam where these two clips join together. Let me just uh, Move that so you can see it. And I'll just click and drag this. And as I drag, you can see that I've got a little pop-up window which shows me the video. It shows me in the upper left uh, what the time marker is for the end of the clip. So 10 seconds, 15 frames. And I can see what my entire duration is. So I'm going to make that, I don't know, maybe five or six seconds. And as I let go of that, all of the other clips sort of snug up to fill the space, so there's no empty space there. And let's do the same thing for this other clip. I'll just make that a bit shorter. And this other one is pretty long, so I'll just make that shorter. Now, the, the important thing to understand here is that these clips, I'm not actually trimming them. I'm just changing their duration, so I can always kind of uh, expand them out and they would go back to the same length that they originally were. And one other thing I want to mention here uh, that, that is important with video is that when you save a video file in Photoshop, so if I save this right now as a Photoshop format file, Photoshop does not embed these video clips in the file it establishes a link to where the files are stored on my hard drive. So it becomes very important to have a really clear, logical, and organized uh, file structure for the video clips you're using uh, in your Photoshop project. Because if you rename the videos or move them to another location on your hard drive, Photoshop will lose the link to where that is. And when you open up the file, uh, the, the Photoshop file, it'll tell you that there's a, a missing video. It can't find that file. So it is important to have you know, pretty good uh, organized uh, file structure for video projects. But Sean, you don't have to keep your video clips on the same drive as the Photoshop project. No, no, they don't have to be on the same drive, but whenever you open up that file, you know, Photoshop's going to go look to that location on that drive to try to find them. So, for instance, if you had an external drive and had all your videos on an external drive, but your main working file was just saved to the local hard drive on your computer, uh, if you tried to open it up at a time when you didn't have the external drive connected, you know, it's going to give you a little uh, dialogue when you open the file saying, well, I can't find this. Okay. So that's the reason why it's, it's important to have uh, 
Uh, I mean, you know, obviously good file organization is important in any case, but, but it's even more important with video type projects. Okay, so I've got my clips arranged here, and if I scrub through here by taking the playhead and just scrubbing through, we can see it just switches from one to the next. And what I want to do is first is create a transition between the waterfall and then these uh, kind of, you know, fuzzy dandelion type flowers here. So I'm going to come over here to the controls of the left side of the timeline, and I'm going to open up this one right here, which is my fade and transition uh, options. I can set a duration for the transition down here. Maybe make a little bit more than one second. And I can have a regular fade, a cross fade, fade to black, fade with white, or I can fade with a custom color if I want to. I'm just going to choose a cross fade here, and I'm going to drag it onto the kind of border between those two clips. And now you can see that it just sort of fades from one to the other. Nice smooth fade. And I can click on that little icon, that kind of little sort of hourglass on its side icon, and I can change it and make a longer fade if I want to. So it's very, very easy to apply transitions like that. And of course you can have more custom transitions too, which I'll show you a little bit later hopefully. Alright, so that's all I'm going to do with, with that one right there. Next what I want to do is I want to adjust the timing of a clip down here. So I have this shot of the photographer photographing the ice. And then I have this shot here. And a few seconds into this, a large iceberg kind of rears up and splashes up. There it is. So I want that to happen pretty much right after this clip ends of the photographer. So it looks like that's what the photographer is shooting. So I'm just going to put my cursor on the border between these two, so I highlight that, and I get that pop-up window which shows me the content of the video, and right there, that's where the iceberg kind of shoots up out of the water. So I'm going to stop it right about there, and now it tightens up there, the gap, so now as this ends, let's just actually make this a bit bigger so we can see that. As this ends here, there's the one of the iceberg splashing up. So that's how I can adjust for kind of more exact timing. And for this one, I would not have a fade between these two. I'd want to have just sort of a hard cut like I've got right there. And the usual controls of tapping the space bar um, that you have in other video players will do the same thing in Photoshop, uh, play the video or pause the video. So those are the basic uh, things you can do just for adjusting clips that are sequential to each other. And I want to move on now and show you some other things that you can do with adding layers on top of the existing clips and doing some other things. But let me just pause for a quick question break, see if there's any questions. Well, of course I have because I <laughs> it's how I live my life. <laughs> I'm constantly questioning. So I'm very interested in your shooting techniques. And tell me if I'm wrong, but what I noticed in all these clips is it seems like there's some stuff that stays in place and other stuff is moving. Am I right? Uh, well, actually, in all of these clips here, these, these particular clips, the camera is stationary the entire time. The camera's not moving. So was that's that what you feel, And a lot of people don't do that. And I think to their detriment, they're moving the camera around, drives you crazy when you're looking at it. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, well, particularly if it's a handheld, then you get that kind of jumpy, you know, jittery video, and it is kind of, uh, can be kind of visually annoying, especially if it's really bad. Uh, you know, these were all on a tripod, uh, but I, when I shot these, I didn't have a video head on my tripod, so I didn't have a way to do really smooth, fluid panning motion, so that's why there's no panning motions uh, on these particular clips here. So I guess my bigger question is, what are you looking for when you decide, I'm going to do a video right now instead of a still photo? Well, um, a lot of what I'm looking for is, you know, things that I would be photographing as a still photograph. Like, you know, this is a, a composition here I might photograph with a still photograph. Um, same thing with um, this one here. 
So, and, and also, obviously, with video, you're looking for motion to be um, part of it to lend something to it. So, you know, this, all of these have, you know, kind of interesting motion to them. Uh, this one particularly was pretty mesmerizing just to sit there on the beach and watch the water flowing by this large, you know, iceberg here. Uh, well, it wasn't that large of an iceberg. Um, so I'm just looking for you know, good compositions, good light, um, things that help me tell a story, uh, whether it's a story of a place or a story of uh, an event or a moment or something like that. You know, interesting visuals. Good answer. But All I would right. also point out that I see in a number of your clips that there is a stationary object and there are things moving around it. Almost the things you would choose to shoot a time-lapse photo. Possibly, yeah. Sometimes there, there are that. Um, and, and, you know, there are some video clips that you shoot are going to be less successful than others. Um, but I, I think that, you know, the good composition is something that's going to... Uh, benefit any image you're recording, whether it's a still photograph, you know, or a video. And, and time lapse—that's of course a, a whole other can of worms, or, or can of time rather. Um, that maybe we can go into another time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me do a little special effect here. I want to have the the start of this video start off with a black and white still image of the waterfall. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the waterfall layer active in my, my layers panel over on the, the right-hand side of my screen. And I'm going to choose Select All to get a selection border around the image. And I'm just going to use the shortcut of Command-J on a Mac or Control-J on Windows to float up a copy of that layer. So you can see that in the layers panel here. It's a still copy of this layer. But I want to have this on top of the video layer. Now, I don't know if you can see here. Um, obviously, you guys can at this point in time. But people watching the recording, it might be kind of hard to see because it's so small. But on the video layers, there are little film strip icons to show you that it is you know, a movie. So what I want to do is I want to take this layer, and I want to move it out of my layer group, or out of my video group, excuse me. I'm going to drag up in the Layers panel until it's on top of that. So now it's up on top, and you can see in the Timeline panel that it's actually up on top of the other layers here. So let me move that over to the start, and I'm going to add a couple of adjustment layers to this layer here. Go down to my Adjustment Layer menu and I'm just going to choose black and white and I'm not going to do too much to this I just don't want the greens to be too dark there something like that's good and I'm going to clip this to the underlying layer well actually no I'm not going to clip it uh, I'll do that I'll do it a different way I mean scooch this up so we can see this so if you look at the timeline panel here you can see how it is um, sort of mimicking the order of what's going on in the regular layers panel. I have my video group, which is everything that's on this one track on the bottom. Those are all the sequential clips. And then I have this layer up above, which is the still. I'll just rename that waterfall still. And then above that, I have the black and white adjustment layer. So what I want to have is I want to have the, the clip start out as black and white, and then I want to have it, and it's going to start out as black and white in a still photograph, and then it's going to transition to a moving waterfall and then fade to color. So to do that, let's see how long we've got this for. Let's make the black and white about three seconds. And I'm going to click the transition button, which is this little square that's kind of half black, half white. And I'm just going to choose a regular fade, not a cross fade. So crossfades you use on clips that are on the same timeline track. A regular fade is something you would use for clips that are stacked on top of each other. So I'll drag that fade down there, and let's make it a little bit smaller by dragging on that, or shorter rather, maybe a, I don't know, half second, something like that. So now, 
right when I get here, the waterfall is going to start moving. It's still in black and white, so now I want to fade my adjustment layer. So I'm going to put the timeline playhead right about there, and I'm going to come over to the pop-out menu for the timeline panel, and I'm going to choose this choice here, trim end at playhead, and it's going to take that active layer, which is the black and white adjustment layer, and it's going to trim the end of that to the location of the playhead. Because when I added it, it just sort of expanded to fill the entire timeline. And, the, and that trim is just the uh, same thing as if, if you were to have dragged it manually. You could drag it back out and it would re Well, yeah, because so this, this layer doesn't have any content. It's just an adjustment oh, layer. Oh, right, okay, yeah. But, um, but if uh, you were I, to I, use that on a content layer, it would be that same kind of thing since the video file is not actually in the... Yeah, well, let's, let, let's come to the end here with the... the um, the iceberg, and we'll do the same thing here. And this one is, because it's in a video group, I can't really do that there, so if it was on its own layer, I could. But let's go back to the to this one here, and we'll just add a fade onto this, and adjust that fade. Let's make it a longer fade. So this is like the, uh, you know, Dorothy coming out of the black and white house in Munchkin Land to get to color here. And there we are in color. Whoops. Except my effect stops where I clipped it, so I need to adjust the timing. So I'll just click on there and stretch that out to make that timing longer. And we'll run it back. Press the play button and see what it looks like. And again, I don't know how the playback is looking on your end. We can see the effect. It's a little jerky, but we get to see it. Right. So the important thing to realize about this is that I'm just using what I already know about layers to basically create this effect. It's just basically putting a black and white version of the water, a still black and white version of the waterfall shot on top of the video, and then you know running with the black and white adjustment layer that fades out. So that's just sort of a basic way that you can put these things together. And let me actually, at the very beginning, I can put a fade with black at the very beginning here. And let's move this down here. So I can have a title here, and it fades up from black and then kicks in like that. So you can do a lot of interesting effects uh, blending still photographs with video as well. And that actually brings me to the next thing I wanted to show you. Uh, I'm going to do this real quick. I'm going to go and grab another photograph. And this time I'm going to do it kind of the old-fashioned way. I'm just going to come out here to this and uh, just drag that into Photoshop that way. This is a still photograph. Do you ever use the mini bridge inside of Photoshop to get your photos? You know, I've never really used mini bridge. It's never really been something that I found to be that useful. I don't either. That's weird. Um, yeah, I mean, it was just, I mean, I, I've seen some people do interesting things with it, but uh, um, I've never really. Um, been too, too enthralled with it. <laughs> so I have this, this is still photograph. I'm going to bring this into my video file um, by just dragging it over onto the name tab of the video file, and I'll drop it down. And it's showed up here inside the video group in my layers panel. I don't really want it in there, so I'm going to drag it up to the top of my layer stack. And now you can see in the timeline panel how it's up here in the top of the layer stack. Now it's much larger than the dimensions of the video here. And I should mention that when you when you get to be working with video, you've got these sort of certain set dimensions to think about. So these clips are 720p, 720 pixels high. Um, most digital SLRs 
today will shoot video that's 1080p. So that's 1920 pixels wide by uh, 1080 pixels high. So you have to realize that if you're bringing your still photographs, you're going to have to size them down. But what I want to do here is I want to actually size this smaller and make it move during this clip. So what I want to do is I want to turn this layer into a smart object so I can do this non-destructively. So I'm going to choose um, layer, where is it? All right. Oh, I'm not on the right layer. There we go. Convert to smart object. There we go. So now I can make this smaller. Now here's a great trip. I just trick. I just chose Command T on the Mac, Control T on Windows to go into free transform, but I can't see all the transform bounding box. So if I just choose fit on screen from the view menu, it will show me the whole bounding box, which is pretty useful. I'm going to hold the shift key down to scale this a bit smaller just so I can see what I've got going on here. And basically I want to have this move from side to side during the clip. Something like that. So I'll say that that's okay. And let's put this here. Now we get into something different with video, and that is something called keyframes. This is cool. <laughs> yeah. So over on the left side of the timeline panel, you have these you know, little sections that can be opened up for each layer. And they have this keyframe capability. And what a keyframe is, is the ability to place a marker at a certain point in time and then apply a transformation to the layer and have that transformation end at another point in time. So my transformation here is just going to be a quick little pan from side to side. You know, I have to say, Sean, this looks really familiar. And when I'm trying to remember what it's from, do you remember this program called Live Motion? Uh, yes, I do. A long, long time ago. I, I think know. that's where those came from, those little clock-looking things for various properties of a layer. I think so. Be, yeah, well, keyframes are, are pretty common in many video editing programs, so uh, people who already under, know After Effects and Premiere and stuff like that will be familiar with keyframes. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to place a keyframe with this layer active. I'm going to place the keyframe a little bit before my layer starts. So I'll just click the stopwatch over here on the left and it puts this little yellow diamond symbol there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do two things. I'm going to make it smaller. So I'm going to transform it and I'm going to move it a little bit. So I've moved my playhead down towards you know the end of this uh, clip and, and actually this clip is expandable because it's not really a video clip it's a still photograph so I can make it as long or short as I want so let's just put that there and now I'm gonna go back in and choose free transform again so that's command T on a Mac control T on Windows and let me show my view menu fit on the screen so I can see all of those handles there and hold down the shift key as I do this. Something like that. Actually, let's get the whole thing in here. And then move it over like that. And I'll press return or enter. And now you can see Photoshop has automatically added another keyframe here at the end. So it sensed that I was doing a transformation to that layer, and since I'd already added a keyframe at the beginning, it has um, registered that. So now, as I scrub through here, you'll see what will happen is, is this is transforming the layer as I, as, as it goes by in time. And that is a segue for moving on to our next image. Any questions? That's very cool. Now this is the here's the thing is that simple transitions like this or panning or the Ken Burns effect or something like that you know those are things that you can do very very easily uh, in other video programs and even in Photoshop you've got 
the option of uh, let me actually just bring in another picture layer so we can show you this. There are some canned effects. Bring that one in. And if we go to this layer here, if I go to this little triangle button at the bottom or at the, at the end of the layer in the timeline panel, you can see that there's a, a couple of motion choices or, or a handful of motion choices, pan and zoom, pan, zoom, rotate, rotate and zoom. So those are things that you can just put on there um, to have Photoshop do that for you. So simple things like that, Photoshop will, will do that. So I can choose to zoom out here, and I could choose to pan, I don't know, 90 degrees, and let's see what this does. And you can see how that's, that's just the automated uh, kind of canned panning and zooming effect. But doing it manually with keyframes gives you a lot more control. So what I want to move to now is a different clip. And let me just sort of go out to QuickTime here and find this. So I'm just going to scrub through this, and this is a, a finished video, and this is ones you can watch on Vimeo um, and also on the YouTube link, the Bear River title sequence. At the beginning of this, a line comes down and appears, and it's the line of a river. And I want to show you how I did that. And that element or that motif shows up throughout this title sequence. So, for instance, here it is again. And the Bear River title sequence, if you, if you watch it, it's about a minute and a half. The entire thing was done all in Photoshop. So nothing was done in any other video program. And there's, this is really what I use kind of as my, my experimentation laboratory to see how I could push the envelope and see what I could do. So let me come back here and go over to my Riverline file. So... Let's show you what I've got going here in this file. I have a series of layers. Well, first, let's turn all of these layers off so you can see what I've got. So in my layers panel, I have a video of just some water uh, in a, a canal. So this is just sort of water passing by in a shallow canal. I added a couple of adjustment layers, hue saturation and curves to darken it and make it this really obvious blue color. So those are the adjustment layers here that are affecting the video of the river or the, or the canal here at the bottom. So those are down here at the very bottom of my timeline panel. Next, up above, I have a shape that I made. And I've got a couple of these in here. There's one. So this is just a shape of a river. And what I wanted to have happen is I wanted to have the rivers just sort of flow into the shot. So to accomplish this, I have above this a layer that is totally black. And that layer is called Reveal River Line. And it's just a layer filled with black. That's all it is. And there it is going away. So let's stretch up here and look at our timeline panel. So I just showed you how to place a keyframe and transform a layer. So in the case of the example a few minutes ago, it was that picture of the rocky cliff. And it started zoomed in, and then I zoomed out. So in this case, what I'm going to do is get rid of my existing keyframes on this layer, and I'll start again. So at the start of the timeline, maybe a little ways in there, go in a second or so, I'll add a keyframe by clicking on the stopwatch for position. And then I will get to the point where I want the river line to be totally revealed. Uh, let's see, make it about, I don't know, three seconds, four seconds or something. So now I'm going to make that reveal Riverline layer active here. 
And I'm going to zoom out so I've got plenty of room to work. I'm going to place my cursor up at the top with the Move tool. And I'm going to just drag it down. So I am manually moving the layer down. That's all I'm doing. And I'm going to move the layer all the way out. So now that layer has moved out of the canvas area. You can't see it. That's why its thumbnail is now transparent, because it's off the canvas. But if we look here in the timeline panel, you can see that Photoshop has added a keyframe. So if I come back here, and let's just zoom up so we can see this a bit better. As I scrub through here with the playhead, here comes the river. OK? And so how do I then? So let me be clear. That's happening because the reveal river line layer is moving down over that period of time, correct? Yes. As, as I pause in the middle of this, look at the thumbnail for this layer, both here in the timeline and here in the main layers panel. You can see here it's showing the position of that. I move it back, it zooms up. So I just got this idea, and maybe you could tell me if this is possible. Um, what if you had, instead of a separate river line reveal layer, a layer mask on your river line layer, and you unlink them, and then you move the mask? Would that work? You can, and I, I cover a lot of this in my course on creative video compositing in Photoshop uh, at lynda.com. So if you follow the link in my, you know, the little name banner under my uh, thing, I don't know if it's showing here, probably not. Um, but if you follow that link, just go to lynda.com, lynda with a Y, lynda.com slash Sean Duggan, you'll see my creative video compositing with Photoshop course, and I go into a lot of, you can animate layer masks. So you notice that on some of these layers here, there is the option to animate a layer mask position, to animate a layer mask being turned on or off. You can animate with keyframes layer styles, having layer styles turn on and off, opacity, position, transformations, etc. So there is quite a lot you can do, and I go into that in a lot of depth in the lynda.com course. And, and for guys, those people, I, for those people who are that. not, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I will give my personal endorsement. That is one of my really favorite courses on lynda.com, and I watch a lot of them, of course, and there's something so unique about it, and Sean is such a good explainer, but more, it's that it's really uh, special techniques that you don't see anywhere else. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I had fun with it. So let me just show you. So now we have this, this river line um, composite here where the river is revealed and what I would do now I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail here but what I would do now is I would come to the file menu and I would choose um, export render video and I would render out an actual video file of this like an mp4 file uh, I'm not going to go into the settings I would use here but you know I would want to have it be the, either the same size or the size of my target file etc etc so I'd render it out and here I'll show you what I would do with it once I'd rendered it. So let me come back out here, and uh, let me go and get, and actually let me just, uh, go out here, and we're going to get that, and then here's one of these here. So let's get first this, bring that into Photoshop. So here's an actual clip from the Bear River, um, video which shows this mysterious crate floating down the river and being swept around the bend. So what we're going to do is we're going to add the river line to this file right here. And I'll give you uh, some insight into why I did the river line the way I did. So let me just bring that into Photoshop. Now, I'm doing this the old-fashioned way in terms of adding the files. I'm just going to drag it and drop it. The reason I like when I'm doing composite effects, the reason I like to drag and drop is that it doesn't place it in a layer group. So I can just take my file here, drag it up on top of the River Crate file, drop it, and there it is. Now, I want this to appear kind of more over on the side. Now, there's a reason why I photographed this, or rather I set up this effect of the river line appearing. Uh, there's a reason why I did it on black. Can anybody guess what that might be? A blend mode. 
Very good. <laughs> Virtual gold star for you, Jan. Yes, a blend mode, because there are certain blend modes that do not see black. So I will choose from the blend mode menu in the layers panel. I will choose screen, or I could even choose lighten if I wanted to. Screen works better in this case. But you can see that now I've got the river line appearing over the video footage. And it, it's nice here the way it's actually lining up in terms of the time that it's sort of exiting the frame right when the crate exits the frame. So that's how that was done. It's taking advantage of something that I already knew about Photoshop, which was blending modes, knowing that uh, black, white, and 50% gray are really powerful colors when you're working with blending modes because some... Um, some blend modes kind of just ignore those and pretend like they're not there. Now, one thing to keep in mind uh, about what you can and can't do in Photoshop is um, a, a lot of people know about green screening or blue screening where you photograph something in front of a green screen or a blue screen and you can magically drop that color out and you know create, you know, cool special effects that way. You can do that in After Effects, and I'm sure you know many other video editing programs, but After Effects does it very well. Uh, it's not something that you can do in Photoshop. So the, the limitation with Photoshop is masks that follow motion in the video. That is really, really hard to do. There's, there's ways you can get around it, and I'll show you one last quick trick. Um, that may work in, in certain situations, but for real motion masking, you're going to have to go into um, a program like After Effects. Let's see if I have this other one here. Uh, I guess I don't have that one up yet. Anyway, there's uh, if I go back to my Vimeo page here, I'm not going to play this. I'm just going to put it so you can see the thumbnail. Uh, this short video, it's just a little over a minute long, is one that I did um, in Photoshop and After Effects. And the After Effects part is the opening of um, an iris that shows up here. Let me see if I can click through here. So this iris opens up, and because it's in motion and you suddenly see the stars behind it, that's not something I could easily do in Photoshop. So there it is opening up. So those are the limitations to what you can do in Photoshop. But I've got one more quick short thing to show you that um, could be a way around that in certain situations. Any quick questions before I get into that? I do have a question. That crate, was that actually floating in the water or you put it there? No, it's actually floating in the, ro in the water. <laughs> Aren't you lucky? Perfect. Well, oh no, I, I mean, I, I put the crate there, yes. <laughs> I, I thought you meant that I composited it in there with some special effect. No, I meant did it actually float by you. <laughs> no, my, my special effect was I went down to, to the Bear River, which is about 10 minutes from my house, and I, you know... I would set up the camera and everything because I was on my own. I just sort of set up the camera and started it running, and I had the crate set up on the rock in the background, and I would go throw the crate in. <laughs> and, and a couple times, it actually, it, it kind of went places where I didn't expect it to go. Like it went out into the middle of the river, and I thought I was going to lose it, and but it eventually came back. So, well, it's a beautiful crate. <laughs> it is a beautiful crate. I'm, I'm I was very pleased. I did not lose it. Yeah, it worked. It's sort of the, the whole, it, it appears at several places in throughout this minute and a half long title sequence. It's kind of the central mystery of that title sequence is this crate floating down the river. All right, so let me go back to one other file here and um, show you this. Let's see, do I have this open in quick time here? Waterfall clock. There we go. So I'm going to show you the layered Photoshop file of, of how I made this. I'm not going to go through and, and show it to you step by step um, because there's just not enough time. It but is so in the, cool looking. Yeah, this, this one turned out pretty cool. I was pretty pleased with this one. I don't know, again, how, how well that... Oops. 
turn the sound down, how well that shows on your end. It's probably pretty choppy, I imagine. A little, but we get it. Yeah, it's choppy. So it's, we get the, con the concept. Yes. Yeah, so so what, what's nice about this is the waterfall appears to be falling on, in front of the clock there. Uh, in, in most places there. Especially the eight, it actually looks like it's bouncing off the the number eight there, really convincingly. So in the Lynda.com course, I take a version of this and I, and I do something else with it, something a little bit more complicated. It also involves water, uh, but it basically is the same clock. I distress it a little bit more, make it look a little bit uh, like it's more of a ruin, and I composite it into a scene where I have an actor interacting with the structure that the clock is supposed to be part of. Because when I finished this initial version of the, the clock and the waterfall, I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could have it in a place where I could have actors interacting with it? And I imagine an actor, you know, whatever, running up the, the hill here and then, you know, later on appearing inside the tunnel. And I, I never got to the point of putting the actor inside the tunnel, but I did create a version where the actor is uh, interacting with the outside of the clock and looks like he's kind of sneaking in the back door. Uh, and that is actually... Uh, seen on um, this video here on Vimeo, the Time Spy Behind the Scenes, which shows the evolution of this into what it eventually became. So, in terms of how I made this, what I want to do is just open up the Photoshop file really quick just to give you uh, an insight into what that looks like. And... Let's see if I have it up here, where I have it. Uh, let me just go out here. Easier to find it this way. All right, so this is essentially a still composite because it's just a static scene, a view of this clock here. The only difference is that one of the layers in the still composite is a video layer, that of the waterfall. So I guess the important takeaway here is that if you know how to make a still composite in Photoshop, it's really easy to add video to it because video is just another layer in Photoshop. Of course, when it plays, it moves, so you get, you know, that action happening. But if we look at the layers panel here, let me just sort of stretch this out so it's a little bit wider so we can see it. I'm just going to take you through this so you can see what this looks like. I'll just turn all the layers on. So here's the video of the waterfall. Just a video of the waterfall. And then above that, let's make the waterfall black and white, I added the clock. And let's just sort of take a look at what is happening with the clock. So the first thing we have down here is I added a cliff in the background. And then we've got some other action up here. But the clock is one layer and lots of adjustment layers. Down here is the tunnel inside the clock. Actually, let's... Uh, make a selection here and just hide that really quick on the layer mask so it's not so this is the tunnel inside the clock and what's important there from a visual perspective is that it really gives this scene depth because here it's just a flat clock adding the tunnel suddenly gives you depth looking back into the scene and then there's a bunch of adjustment layers that do lots of things there in terms of adjusting the lighting etc and then up above here, I've got layers where I am adding in the cliff and making it black and white to make it blend in. But here is the, the trick that makes this whole thing work. So, so the, the thing about this is that the clock here is up above the waterfall layer. The clock is on top of the waterfall layer in the layers panel. But the water appears to be flowing in front of the clock. What's happening? Again, it's a blend mode that's allowing me to do this. The clock layer is set to the lightened blend mode. Because if we look at the clock layer on its own, 
most of it's very dark, except for the highlights around, um, you know, this face of the clock here. So the blending mode of lighten is what allows the light water to look as if it is falling in front of the letters on the clock. Oh, that's so great. I imagined it was some elaborate layer mask that you made, but that's even better and easier. Well, um, you know, you can make elaborate layer masks in Photoshop, but you cannot animate them to actually match the motion in a scene like you can in After Effects. So, so that's like the, you know, you're going to eventually you'll run up against things, but I was surprised at how much I was able to do in Photoshop just putting to use my compositing skills and my that's masking great. skills. And in the, uh, in the version that you get to do if you go through the whole lynda.com course, this clock is, is in a um, sort of an old tower that's right at the base of a raging river, and, and the river is flowing along the bottom of the clock, and it actually looks, there, there are places where it looks because of the way the composite is constructed, where the, the water is flowing both in front of the numbers and behind it, and you can see a little alcove behind it, and it just is a very convincing composite that I was really pleased with. Very, very cool. So that's, uh, we're up at about timeline here, or the, the time limit, and then that's, that's what I've yeah. got to show. Awesome. That, that's incredible. I did post the link to the lynda.com course there. It's in the community for you. Cool. But uh, I just have to give you a hand. <laughs> yeah, just have to. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but you Thank, know, you. So, Thank you. So here's the thing, Sean. I think that if you want to learn this, there's only one way to do this, and this is to work along with you as you make one of these. Because it's not... Um, like a technique that you can memorize. It is, as you said, knowing things about Photoshop and then being able to translate what you already know into the other environment. And so I really, really recommend that people work along with you. I'm not saying that to promote your course, but to say I believe that to be the only way you're going to be able to understand the subtleties of all of this. What do you think? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, and if you come to the course with uh, a knowledge of Photoshop, you're just going to be able to get up to speed uh, that much faster, but I structured the course in such a way that it starts out simple, uh, like some of the techniques I showed at the beginning of tonight's talk. It starts out simple, and then progressively gets you know more and more involved in terms of doing special effects and doing trickier dissolves and trickier transitions, animating a mask separately from the layer itself, or, or doing other things. So uh, the the Bear River title sequence for the fake TV mystery there, uh, there are uh, several. Uh, or not several, I think three or four different uh, kind of special effects from that title sequence that you get to build in the course as well. So, um, and, and that one, if you watch that on Vimeo and stuff like that, you'll, you'll, you'll get a sense of just what you can do in Photoshop. And, and that one, and even the, the Iceland promo video for uh, my workshop in Iceland in October, that was all, both of those were all done in Photoshop. Very cool. Now, what about the? Um, tell me about the workshops. Do you do this sort of thing in workshops, or are you more out shooting? What goes on? Well, I haven't done um, you know, the video. Playing around with the video stuff is, is relatively new for me. I haven't actually integrated that in any of my workshops uh, yet. Um, the ISIM workshop is primarily shooting, although we do do uh, some sessions of digital processing uh, when we're not out, you know, shooting in the field. Uh, the, the one coming up in October is going to be also shooting the Northern Lights because that's a good time for Northern Lights uh, in Iceland. And, uh, and then I have a workshop coming up in Maine on, um, in late September on creative scene. Uh, and that's mainly a photography workshop, uh, also some digital processing, and that's at the Maine Media Workshops. Maine Media Workshops. How fun. Uh, oh, that's I a great place to take a workshop. <laughs> That's very good. You know, you should also be teaching at, um, I can't say it, Anderson Ranch Art Center. It's a big moment. Oh, right. That's up in That's Snowmass, right? And I'd be happy to introduce you to um, my friend I went to grad school with who runs the photo program. Oh, cool. Yeah, oh, I'd, I'd love to, love to yeah. pursue that line of inquiry. Because, you know, the thing that you do that takes every, I think goes beyond what a lot of people are doing in Photoshop, stills or video, is that you seem to think in concepts and you work on projects. You don't just do, like, a shot here and a shot there. Am I right? Where you have some long-term projects going on all the time? 
Yeah, I do have long-term projects going most of the time. Uh, I mean, I, I think all photographers do shots here and there just because the nature of photography is, you know, we're sort of moved or inspired by something we see and we photograph it. But I definitely do like to work in in project uh, structures and frameworks and you know, work on long-term projects that I work on for, you know, several years at a time. Um, and, you know, with the, the video thing is that I just started to um, look at scenes and start to imagine, you know, here's one thing to keep in mind about making composites, and that could be in a whole other hour that we spend, is that when I, people often ask me, well, how do you get your, your ideas to make a composite? I realize that what I do is I look at a scene and I imagine what else it could be. What else could it be? And, and so Minor White has this great quote that he was really referring to metaphor in photography, I think, but he said, one should not only photograph something for what it is, but for what else it is. And I realized when I was thinking about compositing that that sort of applies perfect to making composites. You're looking at a photograph or a scene and you're imagining what else could it be? What else could I turn this into? So I now I not only look at scenes and I imagine that for still photographs, but I imagine, hmm, how might I use that in a video composite too? Really wonderful. It's so inspiring. You've got me on a whole nother project. I can see another project for me down the road. It really is exciting. Um, and I'm, you know, I always love how uh, creative people can come up with new ways to use the tools as you have and as you continue to do over time. This isn't your only new way or unique thing that you do. So I really appreciate you showing us. Great. Well, thanks for having me. It was, it was uh, great to come by and show you some stuff. How'd you like it? Dave and That's Rob. That's awesome. I, I, you know, I have a question. If you know, as someone uh, uh, in terms of the creative cloud suite, you know, spend most of my time in Lightroom and Photoshop. If I learned the, you know, doing the video stuff in Photoshop, but then, you know, at some point realize, you know, uh, you know, it, I need to do something more. If I need to move, say, to Premiere or After Effects. How much of what I learned in Photoshop, doing the video, is going to translate over nicely, or, or is it going to be like? Ground Zero again. Well, someone who hasn't done hasn't done a lot of video. Right, right. It's a good question. The the main thing that's going to translate to using other programs is going to be the whole concept of the timeline panel because that's the same. Uh, I mean, it may not look exactly the same in Premiere or After Effects, but the, the it's it's laid out basically the same. That concept of adjusting the the time and duration of a video clip, keyframes work essentially the same. There are some differences in the nuances, but those things uh, work the same. You know, but when I was starting with this, I also didn't have a lot of experience with Premiere or After Effects. I, I still don't have a lot of experience with those programs. I've, you know, dabbled in them and done used After Effects for some green screen stuff. But I think what a lot of Photoshop users would experience is they, they're used to Photoshop, and then they open up After Effects, and they just kind of like, their eyes glaze over at the complexity of the interface. <laughs> Right, right. So I, I like oh this idea of, of doing doing it within a tool I'm already mostly used to doing. Uh, used yeah, to, and, and that's why you know I started playing around with video in Photoshop, and and you know once I've run up to the limitations uh, of what I can do in Photoshop, um, that's what sort of has pushed me into those other programs so that I'm you know gradually expanding my knowledge base. But you know. Some of it's going to be different, but the main concept of the timeline panel will totally be transferable to those other programs. Okay. And, you know, I love that approach not only in making things, but also in learning, where you start with something you kind of know, you build on that until you reach the limits of it, and then you go and learn something else, as opposed to trying to stuff it all in your brain at one time where <laughs> you just end up in a big mush. I think that's a really good uh, way to do it. And it's how you structure your courses as well. It sounds like, Sean, uh, that you start with simplicity or things that are familiar and build to new things and more complicated things. Yeah, I mean, if it's if it's a general overview course like like this one is over at Linda.com, I, I felt you know it was good to start for people who've never used Photoshop for video at all. They sort of have to know the basics. Here's how you import clips. Here's how you export. Here's how you arrange them. Blah blah blah. And then you know we get into some of the more you know more intricate things. And there's a variety of exercises that are you know kind of informational graphics that you might create for a video, more promotional things you might do for a company or whatever, and then you know, the title sequence, and then, you know, it kind of closes off with these, you know, sort of surreal Game of Thrones-type composites. <laughs> cool. Well, I'm really excited, and I'm going to listen to the whole course as soon as I finish 
the last chapter of this book. <laughs> it's on my, uh, what do you call it, my bucket list, in my bucket list to listen to the whole course. Writing so, books is a lot of work. Man, oh, man, I forgot. I've, doing, I've done that. But you know what? When you get it, when you do it, you feel so good, don't you? Yeah. Like you've really accomplished something. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when they when your box of books shows up on your door, you know your first look at the book. That's what's great. Ah, I know. But <laughs> but what I'm looking forward to also is in the future all these live courses that I teach. I won't have to prepare anything because all the materials right there, right? You just there you go. There you go. Yeah. All right, you guys. We should go and have our dinner and have some fun tonight before it's bedtime. So thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night.